In 1995, the American Society of Agricultural Engineers designated rubber tires on tractors as a historical landmark of agricultural engineering. When the first tractors appeared on farms in the 1890s, they were equipped with steel wheels, which they continued to use for a long time. Inflatable rubber tires did not appear on tractors until 40 years later. Although steel wheels had several disadvantages, such as vibration and poor handling when traveling over rough terrain at a top speed of about 3 miles per hour, which was only slightly faster than horse-drawn ones, they were quite acceptable for steam tractors. Steam power on farms was used primarily for stationary tasks, such as threshing. For plowing and cultivating, steam engines were primarily used in cable systems, where the machine did not move, but worked from a stationary position at the edge of the field. The light and maneuverable tractors with internal combustion engines that appeared later would have been ideal for towing agricultural machinery, if not for a problem that was discovered. The steel wheels used previously were not designed to provide maximum traction during field work. The more efficient a tractor's design is, the less engine power is expended on self-maintenance and propulsion, and therefore, the more engine power is available for drawbar traction. This was clear even in the early stages of tractor development, yet the efficiency of wheeled tractors of that time, on various soils, ranged from 0.5 to 0.3, and sometimes even less. And the energy required to roll a tractor across a field averaged 35% of its power. Naturally, this state of affairs was unacceptable and designers worked diligently to improve its performance. After studying all the external factors affecting a tractor's energy consumption for its own propulsion, it was determined that it could only be reduced by reducing its weight. The lower the tractor's tear weight, the less power would need to be expended on rolling it. This would seem logical and the right course of action, but reducing the tractor's weight led to a decrease in the tractor's traction weight, the load on its drive wheels, which, in turn, led to a decrease in the tractor's traction on the ground. If the tractor's weight decreases in an uncontrolled manner, a situation may arise where the force acting on the drive wheels from the tractor's engine exceeds their adhesion to the ground, which will lead to an undesirable phenomenon known as slippage leading to a decrease in the tractor's traction force. Therefore, reducing the tractor's weight is only permissible up to a certain traction weight limit. Otherwise, measures must be taken to improve the drive wheel's traction using other methods. In standard wheeled tractors, only the rear wheels act as drive wheels, and the traction weight is equal to the load on only this pair of wheels. If the front pair of wheels is also driven, the traction weight will be equal to the weight of the entire tractor. Thus, with a 4x4 tractor, the desired traction can be achieved with less weight. A similar result can be achieved with tracks. Four-wheel drive tractors were complex and expensive to manufacture and maintain. A typical example is the Massey Harris GP1522, one of the first models of this type to appear on the market. The GP1522, with a curb weight of approximately 3,861 pounds, had a tractive effort of approximately 2,794 pounds and could pull a Model 35 240 plow. However, although this was the early 1930s, with an initial retail price of $1,000, only about 3,000 of these tractors were produced. All-wheel drive tractors did not become widespread until the 1950s. Another way to increase tractor traction is to install various types of lugs on the wheels, in the form of ribs, protrusions, and spikes that dig into the ground as the machine moves. A tractor with properly lugged wheels, with sufficient engine power, had a traction force two to three times greater than a tractor with wheels without lugs, with the same traction weight. It's not worth thinking that wall lugs are simple iron contraptions that will work if they're only somehow bolted to the rim. The lugs were made of high-quality steel, stamped, or cast with a special profile. Some tractor manufacturers offered a wide range of lug designs for different soils and operating conditions. If these were ribs, they were positioned on the rim parallel to the wheel axis or at an angle, 
Angle ribs were usually attached to the rim so that the end of one lug was flush with the beginning of another lug or even overlapped it. The studded lugs were also installed in a specific order. Calculations and experiments determined the lug's trajectory as it entered and exited the ground, as well as the deformation of the soil and lug during this process and their condition during slippage. As a result of these studies, the optimal lug profile was determined. As the wheel rolled, the lug followed the shape of the walls of the resulting depression and did not cause additional soil deformation, thereby reducing the wheel's rolling resistance. To increase the wheel's contact surface and thereby reduce the pressure on the ground, an extension rim was attached to the wheel. If the add-on rim was equipped with lugs, then it is clear that this would further increase the wheel's grip on the ground. The lugs were made of 1040 grade steel. The total weight of the lugs installed on a single Fordson exceeded 440 pounds. A set for a single McCormick Deering 1530 consisted of 64 lugs, each weighing four and a quarter pounds, and was secured to the rim with two bolts, nuts, and Grover spring washers. The extended rim version had 80 lugs. When determining the number of lugs on a wheel, the primary consideration was the need to ensure consistent operation. Even with the widest spacing, the complete release of one lug should be followed by the complete penetration of the next. However, placing lugs too close together on the rim was unacceptable, as this would lead to excessive soil adhesion to the wheel. As for lug size, Although increasing their length increased traction, in practice, excessively wide and tall lugs were discarded due to the high energy consumption required to operate them. It should be noted that not every country, with its level of metallurgy and metalworking development, could afford to manufacture tractor lugs. For example, Soviet Russia, having begun to crudely produce copies of Fordson and McCormick International in its factories, continued to purchase lugs for them from the United States for a long time, paying in gold. When tractors operated on wet and sticky soil, dirt accumulated between the wheel lugs, reducing their efficiency. To prevent this, various self-cleaning devices were developed. For example, a complex system of retractable self-cleaning lugs. In this mechanism, the lug blades were attached to spokes, which were driven by a rotating eccentric. When the wheel was in contact with the ground, the lugs extended into the working position through slots in the rim, and after the wheel rolled, they retracted into the rim. Another cleaning device was designed as a mounted scraper. However, due to their complexity, all such systems were not widely used. The classic, simple wheel designs with attached lugs were primarily used. Some of the disadvantages of steel wheels have already been discussed above. They didn't disappear even when lugs were installed. On the contrary, the lugs added another problem. They could cause surface damage. For this reason, lugs were banned on many roads, and the tractor couldn't be used for transport operations. The solution was to remove the lugs or cover them with a protective steel ring, the overtire, before the tractor was driven on public roads. But this was additional, time-consuming work, and the ride remained rough and slow. A radical solution to the problem could have been to install rubber tires on tractors. It should be noted that by this time, in the 1920s, rubber tires were already used on many types of transport. They were installed on bicycles, motorcycles, cars, and airplanes, but not tractors. In the United States, Ford and B.F. Goodrich were among the pioneers of rubber tires for automobiles. Based in Akron, Ohio, the B.F. Goodrich Company began as a manufacturer of rubberized hoses, which were sold mostly as fire hoses. The company also produced rubberized belts. As the company grew, it began to manufacture pneumatic bicycle tires, eventually leading to the production of pneumatic automobile tires in 1896, making B.F. Goodrich the first company in the United States to manufacture this type of tire. B.F. Goodrich was not the only tire manufacturer in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Among its competitors were Goodyear, Firestone, General, and Uniroyal. Due to extensive research and scientific methods, such as tire wear evaluation and longevity testing, B.F. Goodrich was at the leading edge of the industry. Ford Motor Company, then owned by Henry Ford, 
chose BF Goodrich tires to be fitted in the new Model A in 1903. The raw material used for rubber production in factories at that time was natural rubber, extracted from the rubber tree. The rubber tree grows in humid tropical regions near the equator, both in wild forests and in cultivated rubber plantations. Raw rubber from all these regions was primarily supplied to the United States. Trees are typically tapped for around 40 years before being replaced by newer trees, carefully cultivated from saplings that have been diligently planned into plantation activity. Rubber production begins with the harvesting of latex, a milky sap-like substance found in the bark of certain rubber trees. To obtain latex, a skilled worker, called a rubber tapper, makes a precise incision in the bark of the tree using a specialized tool. This incision allows the latex to flow out of the tree into a collection cup. The tapper repeats this process on multiple trees until enough latex is collected. Native men and women carry large containers and buckets on their heads, hanging them on yokes and in their hands, and pour the latex through a sieve into a large vat. Next, the latex is coagulated. There are many ways to coagulate or thicken the latex. Acetic acid was most commonly used for this purpose. After the latex hardened, large chunks of coagulated rubber were cut from vat. Rubber washed and rolled into sheets with an uneven surface is called crepe rubber. To dry, it was exposed to the warm rays of the tropical sun. The raw rubber was then delivered to the factory in mats and biscuits. There, crude rubber was squeezed between rollers to force out the dirt and impurities. After washing, it was dried in vats of high temperature. The raw rubber was mixed with zinc, sulfur, and lamp black to give it color and strength. This was done in a large pan, then processing continued. To make the inner tube, a thin sheet of rubber was rolled about a metal cylinder and vulcanized at over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. After removal from the vulcanizer, the resulting rubber tube resembled a rubber hose. The ends of the tube were then joined, a hole was punched in it for the valves, and the valve stems were inserted. Each inner tube was air-tested. Cotton fabric was also used for tires. The cotton for the casing was grown in Arizona. The cotton fabric was inspected for flaws, thickness, and durability. The fabric was placed in a powerful press, and the rubber was forced into the cotton. The rubberized cotton was cut into strips by machine and hand. A worker molding the rubberized cotton into tire-shaped form, and each layer was pressed. The tire was lowered into a mold, the inner parts of which had a tread pattern. A hydraulic press compressed the molds, creating the tread pattern. The tires in the molds were fed into a vulcanizer for heating, then removed, and after a final inspection and cleaning, the tires were ready for sale. Attempts to use rubber tires on tractors were initially unsuccessful. In 1926, Hoyle Pounds modified a Fordson tractor with zero-pressure truck tires on special rims to improve performance in sandy soils in Winter Garden, Florida. A successful business resulted. This type of wheel began to be installed on special-purpose Fordsons. Rubber wheels were quieter and provided a smoother ride than standard steel wheels, but they were unsuitable for field work. In 1929, Hessel Ruda equipped his International Harvester Farmel tractor with low-pressure rubber tires to pick corn in muddy fields near Rock Valley, Iowa. He found they performed well in all conditions. Regular truck tires, with an inflation pressure of about 70 pounds per square inch, were sometimes used on off-road tractors. In 1931, B.F. Goodrich began producing rubber pneumatic tires with steel rims for Farmel tractors, which farmers already had in use. Machines with rubber pneumatic tires demonstrated better traction than their all-steel counterparts, were faster both in and out of the field, and made the tractor drivers work more comfortable and cleaner. However, farmers doubted the durability of rubber tires and feared delays due to punctures.
A breakthrough in tractor rubber tires began in the United States when Alice Chalmers tested low-pressure inflatable tires on its 33-horsepower Model U tractor in 1932. The tractor belonged to a customer with a 150-acre dairy farm in Wisconsin, and the tires, designed to operate at a pressure of only 15 pounds per square inch, were salvaged from an old airplane. Tests followed using special tires developed by Firestone in close collaboration with Alice Chalmers. The tests were successful, but sales of the Model U with optional rubber tires in 1932 were disappointing. In 1933, the Alice Chalmers WC Row Crop tractor was introduced. It was the first tractor equipped with pneumatic tires as standard and steel tires as an option. It also became the first rubber tire tractor tested in Nebraska. To boost demand for the new tires, Alice Chalmers launched one of the most extensive advertising campaigns in tractor history, employing famous race car drivers to demonstrate the speed advantages of rubber tire tractors. Races with tractors tuned to speeds of approximately 37 miles per hour attracted hundreds of thousands of spectators. In 1933, racer Barney Oldfield reached 64.2 miles per hour in his Model U with high gearing and Firestone tires. And later, in 1935, Ub Jenkins reached 68 miles per hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats. However, pneumatic tire tractors weren't just making waves on the racetrack. In 1934, several universities published reports showing that low-pressure rubber tires, compared to steel lugs, consumed a third less fuel and produced a quarter more output, reduced rolling resistance by 68% on unplowed fields and by 46% on plowed field, and increased travel speed by 36% on unplowed fields and 30% on plowed ones. Goodyear, a leading manufacturer of rubber tires for agricultural machinery, conducted experiments with a formal 20 tractor equipped with rubber tires and a similar tractor with steel tires, which yielded the following results. When both tractors were cultivating for 16 hours, the first cultivated an area of 37.3 acres and the second 28 acres. The first used 26 gallons of fuel, while the second used 30. The hourly output of the rubber tire tractor was 2.33 acres, while the steel tire tractor produced 1.75. Goodyear thus concluded that rubber tires increased work efficiency by 30.32%, reduced time by 25%, and decreased fuel consumption by 34%. No new tractors in 1930 had rubber tires. Not counting crawler tractors, about 10% of all new American tractors purchased in 1935 were equipped with the new rubber tires, increasing to 20% in 1936 and reaching 45% in 1937. By 1940, 95% of new-wheeled tractors were equipped with rubber tires.